My, I've not been involved in the permaculture community before. So I live in, 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 in Hawea, if people know where Hawea is, next to Wanaka, which is near Queenstown, which is in the middle of the South Island of New Zealand, three and a half hours inland from Dunedin. So we don't have, it's not in the city, but it's a very remarkable place in central Otago for those who've been there. And um, snapping on the heels of that is a billion dollar tourism industry, which um, is really in trouble. And um, that industry is waking up to that fact that it's in trouble. So they've, they've engaged with us actively to help solve some of their major issues. Yes, and the bubble bursting. Um, we, I, I find it very interesting to look at what sustainable practice is and what permaculture is. This has been an interesting um, conversation for me to learn about. I mean, I've read Mollison's work and I've you know, understood the permaculture pr principles, um, which many people have mentioned here about care for the earth, care of people and fair share. And as, as a fundamental way to think about sustainable practice, for me, th there's very little difference. Yeah? Um, the... the um, the way in which this is thought about across each aspect of our lives with you know the way that's talked about is very very elegant and it's um and it's beautiful but there's just no way someone in business is going to look at that yeah right now with the people i work with who are, who are running running businesses they have very limited time um you know in terms of the level the way you do training how, how do you train and we have we have some big blocks you know some major blocks we, we have blocks such as we know it all thank you go away, or don't even come, right? Um, problem, what problem? Um, you know, there's some major issues. Credibility around universities, in my opinion, delivering very poor learning through lecturing, through styles of learning, uh, teaching, which are just not appropriate for real learning, and um, not experiential, but very theoretical. And the risk when you get theoretical in the space of sustainable practice is it's just woolly. And, and of course, that's been our experience um, around the place. So we, we decided we needed to ground it very much um, in, in science and very much use a methodology that's respected internationally to think about that and we, we chose to work with the Natural Step International as a, an organisation based out of Sweden which aims for a sustainable, which aims for a sustainable human society. So, and and the, I guess the Natural Step became famous um, in, from a guy named Carl Henry Rebeu who came up with these four principles which if you look at them are very similar to the fundamental permaculture principles there's very little difference around you know taking what nature replaces you know don't dig stuff up faster than nature's um, put you know nature puts stuff under the ground for a really good reason because <laughs> it doesn't mix with water and life you know the, this, the science behind these is very very strong so this this appealed to the rationalists um, within our organisation who, when they came in. And, and of course advocating for a systems approach is key, rather than hi, um, a piecemeal approach. Where people get in their drill hole, I'm an engineer, this is my world, I'm going to drill deeper and deeper and deeper. And unfortunately we tend to reward people more and more for detail, don't we, and less and less for general. Um, and that's a big block when it comes to, comes to this subject. So what Otago Polytech made a decision to do was we need to take this complex and confusing area and make it simple and applicable and relevant. How do we do that? Come on in. No problem. In oh yeah, that'd be delightful. Thanks very much. Um, so, you know, how do you do this? So we, we've, we've, we've begun using some very simple frameworks to think about this stuff and I'll, I'll get on and tell you the stories and, and apply them to how we've used that. So for those who don't know, Polytechnics or TAFEs if you're from Australia are educational charities by, by an act of government. They're not allowed to make a profit. Okay? In fact, we're, we're made, we have to make a one, between a 1% and 3% profit on what we do. So it doesn't, you know, we still turn over $55 million a year in terms of um, revenue, but in terms of profitability, things must not exceed that cap. So they're, they're, they're designed as agencies of government to serve communities. Now it's very interesting if you think about Christchurch's role, Christchurch's politics role to serve their community. It's obviously changed a lot in the last year, hasn't it? You know, enormously. And, and for our institution, we've got a very inspiring chief executive and um, essentially he understands all this work. Phil would be right at home at this conference, yeah? Yet He's a corporate man who goes to Wellington and heads butts government to try and get them to understand and think holistically, right? So having a guy like that 
on your team. And, and w in 2005, the institution made these three commitments. And, and this is no mean feat for an organisation with 700 staff, 12,000 students across 19 vocational areas to embed sustainable practice into every piece of curriculum. Now, if you, if you think about the implications of that, <laughs> it's, it's outstanding, isn't it? it it's just absolutely um, exciting. Creating the living campuses is the idea of creating permaculture spaces within institutions. You have all, these, all this space. Crikey, why aren't we harvesting using, why, why isn't, this, why isn't this, this room that's used here, if they could walk out and harvest a tree to bring in here to work with and plant the next one and close that loop and there's so much learning in that process, right? So how can you use your campus as a learning place? Now, this is all the rage in Europe and the US and these other places who tertiary institutions who be believe they c if they green their campus then everything's dandy, right? But as long as we keep teaching unsustainability, then it's not, obviously. And then of course, once we had one and two sorted, or to a level we were comfortable with, that we were credible, can we now go out and inspire capability for this change to happen? Now, if, if we, those words are very carefully chosen. It's about inspiring through success. There's so many success stories, isn't there, in this space, but we never really hear them in the, in the media, in the mainstream media. We really hear them um, articulated eloquently, and it's usually, you know, the 80-20 rule is one that I like to think about in the space. If you're telling any story in the space, it needs to be 80% based on solutions, and 20% here's the problems, because humans being humans just switch off to um, the problem. So, if it's federated farmers, the chambers of commerce, these guys, it's got to be solution focused because people just don't, there seems to be this utter resistance to hearing about the issues. The way Nicole Foss eloquently put them, for example, or the way Susan Crumdike began to articulate that work, right? So that, that's been our strategy. We, you know, let's put our own house in order before we even talk about this. Now, when I first worked for Otago Polytech in two, two, 2005, my job was to report to the chief executive and go around all these 19 different business units, departments, the midwives, the architects, the engineers, the automotives, the business school, all these people with st people who, are in, who are, have high expertise in this area, yeah? High expertise in their area. I mean, you're not going to go and tell a midwife what to do unless you're really mad, I've learnt. Right? <laughs> They're a wonderful stroppy bunch. I just love them, right? They're just so much energy and power there. Um, but likewise, to go and tell a, um, a carpenter how to um, do sustainable building is, is a very arrogant, rude thing to do, isn't it? So instead, the whole approach was to go and have a conversation. How do we in, in involve dialogue? Because everybody wants to improve the social, economic, environmental and governance aspects of what they do. That, that's what people wish to do. So. The story of Otago Polytech is, we, we did that in a very non-public way. In fact, the first publication we ever put out around this was an in-house document called A Simple Pledge, and it was to commit the organisation, it was about committing the organisation to boldly doing this work. And so what's happened since is, I've, I've ended up, I, I did that work for several years, um, reporting to the leadership team, and, and you know, we, we've, we've since sent a lot of senior staff to Sweden in particular to look at systems there that, that have been used in local government, tertiary education and business to look at what we can learn from that. Because if there's one thing that the Scandinavians do incredibly well, it is long-term strategic planning. And if it's one thing New Zealanders do incredibly badly, it is long-term strategic planning. So, um, you know, we're very casual around the way we do things and that's a function of lifestyle, isn't it, and, and, and our affluence at this current time, which, which I believe isn't necessarily going to last. So it all began for us um, as with the Centre for Sustainable Practice, which, which is now, is, is a, I've got permission to be radical, which is an, inside an institution is, is a great privilege to have, if you get what I mean. I, I have, my brief is to beg for forgiveness, not ask for permission which for me is a pretty nice brief, yeah? Um, poor old Rex, you know, is, is an environmental manager in an institution which is, is, is doing great work, isn't it, right? But it's not, it's not embedded at the roots, is it? And at the trunk, it's more like it's a limb. And that's what recycling is, if we're honest. You know, most recycling is a function of very poor supply chain management, it's a function of very poor um, design. 
because of course we, we won't need to waste things if it's done correctly. So walking into Otago Polytech, it was like, right, if you're going to do this, we, we're going to do it properly. You know, I'll oh, hurry up, set up the recycling systems. No, we're not we're putting a single recycling bin until we've reviewed the supply chain and why we purchase anything, right? So you know, these institutions gobble up a lot of computers, a lot of resources, a lot of buildings, a lot of everything. It, you've got to sit down very carefully and look at where things come from, why, and, and move in that way. So I'm not going to talk so much about the institution that's a whole separate, you know, in terms of the whole operations around buildings, the whole operations, but all those folks have had, a lot, have, have had increasing amounts of training all the time to understand, and my approach is very much to work with the people who are prepared to have the conversation first, and of those 19 schools, 10 got it, the design, the midwives, you know, these places who have thought holistically anyway. The resistance has come from automotive and engineering. You know, these bastions of conservatism from car, you know, but, so the way to involve them is, oh, could you, we're looking at an importing an electric car, can you, can you give us a hand to think about that? Oh, damn right, when can we get it here? You know, that's how you have a conversation with those dudes. You don't rock in and put a framework on the screen. So I just want to walk you through quickly the work we do around um, our projects, our business programs, the research and qualifications, I guess, and, and the fact that increasingly we're having visible leadership. Without, it's not us wanting to have that particularly. We're doing our own thing, but we're getting invited a lot to do stuff. And, you know, for us, when we take on a project, we, we ask ourselves several, this is at the centre now, we ask ourselves three questions very much, okay? Is it going to lead to real change? You know, if this school asked me to come and put in some recycling bins for them, I'd say, well, no, I think a better way of doing it is looking at where the stuff's come from first and get upstream, upstream, upstream. Because I think all of us know, unless you go upstream with your design, it's, you're really just um, playing at the edges. So the other important question is, is, is what we put in place flexible? Because this is a dynamic game, isn't it? Things are changing really quickly. So you don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on infrastructure, which is going to change, yeah? Or commit plenty of people's time and energy to that. And, of course, is the return on investment there of people's time, of energy, of your brand, the risk, all that stuff. It's not, return on investment is not about money, in my mind. It's part of the equation. It's about, it's about the opportunity cost of what else you could do, actually. Right? So we, we've applied this thinking, and, and if we have a look at some of our fundamental principles, you know, it's got to be transformational. So I'll give you an example. We, we, we put commercial biodiesel into um, Queenstown. The, the tourism industry wanted green up to green up. They wanted to put some teeth in the 100% pure brand, please. Help. Right? Help. I love that word, right? Help. Okay. So, conversations. Okay. Quick, um, quick phone calls, meetings, and, you know, what do you really need? You know, what do you think? What could we do? What's really big? 105 tourist buses drive from Milford Sound to Queenstown every day and back. Right? Um, in summer but fear in winter, and it's like, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we could begin to get that fleet to um, run on a closed-loop fuel system New Zealand made? It's, what about that? Um, not because it's the ultimate solution, but to shift their thinking, right? As Susan Crumdike said, electric vehicles and, um, and biofuels have, have got a lot of proving to be done, and in her mind, as a, as a rational engineer, they're not over the line yet. In my mind... What they, what they have done for us in Queenstown has shifted the thinking of a very conservative industry that it's actually only fuel. What's the big deal, right? And, and what's the difference between biofuel and stuff that's been in the ground eight million years? Oh, time. So can, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's, it's about changing that thinking. Partnerships have been absolutely key to us and it's easiest I talk to the projects. Our graduate programs, I'll talk to those in a minute, but this, this and... This idea of a common language. Now, you know, here we are at a permaculture event. There's a language that goes with it. Most people understand it or they wouldn't have come. If you go and work with 500 engineers or you go and work with 500 people from local government or 500 people in business or 500 people um, who are lawyers, um, there's a language, isn't there? And there's a culture and, and it's a, there's, there's a difference there. Now, how can we have a common language? That's what I would ask. So that we're not remaining siloed. Because while we remain siloed in our world of engineering or our world of permaculture or our world of sustainable business or our world of anything, actually, then it's harder to have that conversation. Do people agree? Um, so, 
So having that common language and developing that is just so crucial, and I will speak to that shortly. Having a future focus is crucial. If I go and talk to the most conservative Chamber of Commerce in New Zealand, which happens to be in Dunedin, um, from my experience, <laughs> right? If I talk about now, you know, they've got all the, the problems of now instantly come up as barriers of why they can't do something. If I go and talk, have a conversation about the future, people want very more similar things in the future. We want safety for our kids, we want a decent income, we want healthy streams, rivers, air, we want warm housing that works for people, is affordable. People want that stuff. And, and you know, I have to say, in my, I've been working in this space for 20 years now, and I used to be very deeply um, offended by business. And what's happened for me is I've learnt that business are, are run by people. <laughs> and those people are as desperate as many people at this conference to see change. It's just that they're trapped in their silo, essentially, without the language and the tools. Um, and last but not least, this idea of backcasting, and, and I'll, I'll speak to that because, and here's where I, I believe we, we have some great learning to do from, from cultures who begin with the end in mind. What does the ultimate look like? We haven't even dared to do this in New Zealand yet here. What, what does it look like? If you've got your block of land that you're talking about, or you've got your, your dream, what does that look like in its finished form ultimately for you. It doesn't matter if it's not possible right now. What does it look like? And I think most of us would agree we want cyclic energy water waste systems, we want great community social networks, we want people, we want all that stuff here. And if you have a look at some of the folks who've done this the best in the world, in my opinion, and that's the Scandinavians, you know, the Swedes in 1973 when the oil crisis hit, they made a 50-year plan as a country to be free from imported oil. They, they just made a call. They went, right, 50 years' time, we must be free from imported oil. Now, it doesn't, we don't know how to do that, but that does not matter. We can see that this is a, becoming a finite resource 50 years, right? 50 years. So every government policy lines to that date, okay? To backcast from. If you, if you, so, so the idea of backcasting is just to begin with the end in mind. I, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. Okay, what do I have to do to become that fireman? It's not... You know, we, I think we do do it intuitively. The danger is that we forecast. And when we forecast, we start to say what we can't do. And here's where Susan Crumdike and I diverge a little, in that I would argue that to say it's not possible to have electric vehicles and to say it's not possible to have um, biofuel working is forecasting from what you currently know. If you backcast from what our desired future is, renewable fuel, renewable mobility, for example, then what that does is inspires capability in people to solve that problem. If you say, well, you can't, if you, it's the moment you say can't, <laughs> it instantly shuts that down, if that makes sense. So that's, that's backcasting um, in the long and short of it. So um, we're very much around this idea of, of turning tertiary education on its head. Okay? Traditionally, it's been about knowledge. Right? Pour it in one end, out the other, out you go. It's a big sausage factory graduate. So I, mean, I don't know if any of that's familiar with anyone. Um, and you forget most of it. You have people raving at you, and you only have 18 minutes to concentrate in a presentation anyway. Right? So we're really interested in broadening that around action competence. And, and this is a, this is an, a concept in, in education for sustainability that's very strong. Um, Chris Eames from Waikato University and Barry Law. Um, are very big on this. It's, it's saying you need all of this stuff, okay? Let's just take, okay, action. <laughs> Let's do stuff. Let's not sit in a room and talk about it. That's an utter no-brainer, isn't it? The future focus I've covered. It's so that you can engage conversation more. How are you, happy? <laughs> it's coming back. Connectedness. How well are you networked? This is a very important idea, don't you think? How well are you networked? What, what are you, what's your level of connectedness? And that's not just with people, it's with the place you're in. It's with the spirit of the land, it's all those things. Yeah? Connectedness is kind of the best mainstream word we could find. Uh, pardon? It's like a feedback loop. It's like a feedback loop, okay. And reflection. So reflection, if you think about it, and because most people in this room are, are over 20 by the looks, and we've all had experiences in our life, if you can reflect on what you've already done, is that 
as valid as a learning mechanism than someone standing up and raving at you. It's far more powerful, isn't it? Reflection is an incredible um, thing. So one of the things we've done at Otago Polytech is started to award qualifications based on reflection. Why should you turn up if you've done the work? If you've done the work, you've done it, haven't you? You provide evidence of that work, why can't you be awarded a degree? Now, now we, we um, 120 people graduated last year from Otago Polytech based on that model, and the universities are absolutely packing themselves about this right now because we're saying we believe we can do a three-year degree in three weeks or three months <laughs> for mature learners who've, who want a qualification for whatever reason, but they've done so much learning in their life. That experience is far more valuable than some bald, fat lecturer usually, standing up and raving about their favourite topic and they're annoyed to be there because it's interfering with their research. Hello. So this idea of action competence is that you can go away and do stuff afterwards. Yeah? So I haven't even got to telling you what we do yet, have I? So I better hurry the hell up. Um, so Queenstown is where we began our work. And we began our work there um, primarily because... If people don't know Queenstown, it's a wild west town in the South Island. Um, it's a wild west town now with a really big airport. Um, 5,000 people a day go in and out of that airport in the middle of winter. Australians flying in for skiing, predominantly. It's a very busy place. After Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, it's you know, a big place. And, and there's a billion dollar tourism industry here. Yeah, and it's really hurting. Down 20% last year in terms of economic value. Um, and there's a lot of people getting squeezed. And... I'm going, great, bring it on. The sooner it happens, the better, right? That's my, fig my figuring. The sooner the bubble starts bursting in some of these, it's it, just great. So we've got major issues here. Most expensive real estate in New Zealand. School teachers can't afford to buy a house to live. Even to pay rent is, is 4 50 a week sometimes, you know, for a... For a it's, it's just... Ins it, it went through a period of being very insane, right? And for those of us who've lived there for 25 years, I live in Wanaka, which is an hour's drive from Queenstown. Very different place, but... Queenstown is the economic engine of central Otago. And so to work with those tourism businesses who are hurting, the hurt is the motivation. That otherwise they wouldn't even talk to us. They, they wouldn't even bother. What a bunch of bloody hippies. We don't want to know about you. But, oh, by the way, we're in pain, and um, what you're talking about actually begins to make sense. Help. You know. So we've got an active policy. We only work with organisations who are prepared, how's this, to have their most senior decision makers involved in the conversation. We don't do the environmental manager anymore. We've, we've been burnt with that, and it's not fair on those people because they work their butts off, and the chief executives and leadership teams just ignore them. And it's just, for us, it's unethical and, and not fair. So you're better off to say that to the... So some of the biggest companies in, in the Queenstown area who turns o turn over you know, 20 to $50 million a year, um, we still haven't worked with them because um, we refuse to work with their second-tier managers. Now, it's a position we're very proud of, and it's beginning to yield a lot of pressure on those organisations to genuinely change. Um, so one of the things that came out of our business programs, and we've worked with a lot of businesses um, over, over many years. In Wanaka especially, we, we, we work, I worked with over 70 businesses in the Sustainable Tourism Program, and we sat down, had a, a year-long program where, you know, it's a four-workshop series. First workshop, get your head around the change that's coming, begin to make plans, have a go, make some simple changes, see the benefits, then make a plan of what you're going to do later. That's essentially what we do and have done in most of our business programs in the early days. Um, and out of that has come a range of you know, really interesting relationships with organisations who you would never think would actually be interested in sustainable practice. And, and it's because we've spoken a language that relates to them. So the way we speak to some of these big players, like Nomad Safaris there is a is a four-wheel drive company that takes people on Lord of the Rings tours, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, they've been pretty green in that they've, they've often done, you know, done lots of environmental initiatives to help offset, you know, lots of community stuff, but they've never thought about tying their bottom line into a quadruple bottom line so they can actually re begin to report now on their, their economic performance with their accountant, but now their social, environmental and governance performance. How's your governance performance? That's one of the most threatening questions to business in New Zealand. It's about how, what, what structures have you got in place for your organisation? How democratic are they? How included are people who work for your organisation? Is it a, is it a we, it's our business and we tell our staff what to do? And if that's the case, that's fine, as long as you know that. 
but it's worth people knowing that that has a lot of risk with it because what happens if one of you gets run over tomorrow? Sort of conversation. You get what I mean? So, so that's how we think about that. You know, pine wood, which is a, a massive cesspool of debauchery, it's the biggest backpackers in Queenstown, highest sexual, sexually transmitted diseases rate in New Zealand in <laughs> Queenstown. So people aren't going for the beautiful landscapes always. Well, different, you know. So it's, it's, it's really a party town. It's, it, you know, it's quite hedonistic and it's pretty decadent. And pine wood, you know, it's a massive place. I mean, they, they, they have 600 beds in their, in their backpackers. And... Um, They'd never thought about this stuff until we went there one day and turned on the shower with a bucket of water, did a simple bucket test with water, looked at the flow rate with the clock and going, well, do you realise you're using this much hot water? And if you put these shower heads in that cost this, it would save you $16,000 a year. Do you realise that? Right? So, so it's a kind of a, you know, those sort of conversations begin to get people's attention. And, and that's, whereas the conversation with someone... Um, like Skyline, which is the gondola in Queenstown, for people who know it. Massive business, been going 40 years. They're the mafia, really. They're the big boys in town. Um, you know, how do you have a con Well, for them, they want to, you know, how could we add value? Well, they've got tons of roofs there. Let, let's, why haven't you got solar hot water in place? Have you thought about that? What's your power bill? Right, well, show us your hot water cylinder. Quick look. Oh, well, if you did this, it would so you'd pay this off in a year and a half. Have you thought about that? Oh, okay. What else can you do? Oh, well. You know, how's your branding? What's your marketing like? Oh, oh what do you tell people in Aspen? Because a lot of their clients, you know, Aspen, which is a resort like Queenstown, it's got 30% renewable electricity at the moment, and they had a party when they got to 30%. We did some digging and found out that Queenstown has a 99.9% .9 renewable energy source for all its electricity. Because all the electricity in the south that comes north swings via there. That's not a bad thing to be able to tell your European clients that you're actually running on renewable virtually. 100% renewable electricity for what you do. Now, that's a, they've used that with great, great benefit. Now, what's that worth? You know, what's the value of that? It's, it's worth an awful lot to, got, to people like that, to companies that turn over $25 million a year, you know. Um, so, lots of fun. I'm kind of over it, to be honest. Um, well, I'm over the, the fact of dealing with really ignorant... Um, I, I just, you just can't believe how ignorant some people are who run companies, frankly. That's my personal view, and I... And, and not really interested in education or learning about how it could be done more effectively until there's pain. It's a bit like healthcare, isn't it? People don't care until they're sick. So, so, we, we, decide, so we, 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 we charged into some projects because we figure, well, we've got to model what we want here, eh? Let's just rip into it. Nothing like touching, feeling, tasting. So this is the biodiesel facility in Queenstown. It was the first um, in New Zealand. And this is a group of our graduate students um, who, uh, who were there. And, and I mean, you... You know, it's pretty, what Biodiesel's done is put this work on the map for us. That's what it's done. It's opened up a lot of doors for conversation. I mean, essentially. It's nothing like every day something like that. That's why people love recycling, right? I can get my hands on this and actually do something, even though it has limited value. I, I can do something, yeah? So, very, very exciting, unless it's done very well. If recycling's done very well, of course it's got extreme value. Um, the media benefit, when we launched the Biodiversal Facility, we had 20 media um, outlets internationally, 10 of them from Germany, contact, German, contact um, Destination Queenstown to go, hey, we hear you're doing biofuel, cool, what's that about? You know, so, so Destination Queenstown give us money now every year to do projects because they currently spend $750,000 on marketing Queenstown every year. So we're going, um, can we have a wee piece of that? Thanks very much. You know, because we're doing this, what would you like next year? Sort of conversation. So that's how the partnerships sort of work and, and you know, they go well. So, Steve, hello. So those projects that you're involved yep. with, are they Otago Polytech projects? Uh, yep. Like the biodiversity done, it's actually you guys. Yeah, it's us guys. Yeah, so people, when they buy their, yeah, so we... We hold the we, we manage the biodiesel consortium on be, on behalf of the community. Mm. So, if, so you could imagine us as a big not for profit charitable trust if you wanted. We we do things in a not for profit manner. That's what we do. It's what Robin Francis, you know, the TAFEs do the same thing in Australia. I know it's hard to get your head around, no, but I it's a. One. Oh, you okay? So, yeah, yeah, right. So cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what, but what is what is your vision like? That whatever. Can we get to that? Yes. Cool. Beautiful. Right. So. So we're going, okay, Queenstown's, we did, did all that work in Wanaka and Queenstown and we wanted to up it to the next level, yeah? We're going, look, you've done your awareness work, surely you can see this coming. And um, 
Some can and some can't. But what began to happen was we got invited by other people, other communities, to begin to assist um, with this work. And the Manawatu, just down the road from here, is it, um, to the south for those who aren't from here, um, we began a conversation which essentially went along the lines of, oh, we hear what you heard what you're doing, sounds interesting, come and have a chat. And before we know it, we're, we're running a business program funded by Palmerston North City Council, supported by Vision Manawatu, which is the local, local economic development agency, UCOL, which is the Polytech um, in there, and the Natural Step, which is this not-for-profit they're running. So, you know, last year, um, if I had some speakers, I could show you that YouTube clip. Did someone have some speakers? Look at that. Um, if, if, do you want to do that for me? Thanks, Strathy. That's beautiful. So, so for us, so we're doing this in the Waikato. We're doing it in Auckland. We're doing it in Dunedin. We're doing it in Queenstown. We're about to start in Hanover Springs. There's a whole heap of places where the momentum is building for um, such a program. And these programs aren't arduous. For someone to attend this as a business owner, it commits you to four days a year that you turn up to a workshop. And in between time, you get one-on-one -on -one, um, advice, at coaching at your own organisation to sp specifically work with. Now, it, it, sure, mate, you do what you need to do. So, um, you know, the Manawa 2 programme's been great, the Waikato programme's been great. Who's, no one's in here who's in the white. So, so the likes of John Bryan. <laughs> John Bryan at Uffy Farm, they're, they're in the Waikato program. Um, Sol, Phil from Soulscape in um, Raglan, they're in the program. LIC's in the program, who's the biggest producer of bull semen um, in New Zealand, a Waikato business with a thousand employees, they're in the program. So, so you have this um, amazing conversation that happens when you get John Bryan, um, eco backpackers, law, and other people on that program are lawyers, moteliers whole range of people, and you come into a room and people want the same thing. So we've learnt that when you sit down with a high country farmer, you sit down with a tourism business, you sit down with a motelier, the issues are becoming very similar. Distance to market, affordability of transport, staffing, and the most wonderful eco businesses can go belly up, and we've had one in Monica do this because of, a, of a, um, an unhappy staffing um, situation. Got taken to the employment court, bang had to pay back tons of money to someone for making a poor choice around that. Is that going to go now, do you think? Should do. Big fella. So I might just, um, where are those? That's the question. I needed a program to run it, didn't I? No, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'll, I'll, you can go to YouTube and look at them. It's, it's probably the easiest. Um, so the, the business program, that's where it would sit up if we had. Oh, just the Manawatu Sustainable Business Program? Yeah, that'll work. Um, we, we've got a bit better. You know, how do you talk about this? How do you advertise this to business? You know, we're still not thinking adding sustainable values right yet. <laughs> we, we, we're thinking about throwing it out the window and, and changing it to something else because it's about, a t you know, we're just trying to engage. What language do you use? Um, how do you talk about it? But it's obviously working enough because the, the, the local governments are loving it and for example the course in Auckland that starts next month costs business eight ninety five, dollars with a subsody from a scholarship or 3067 if you're not subsidised and, and so Auckland City have fronted up with 10 scholarships because they want to see business work in this space, they want that. So local government actually want <laughs> what we want but they just don't know how to do it because it's such a complex... Um, question, are you working with anyone outside your region? Yeah, lots of people. Yeah, and outside New Zealand. We, we did an interesting piece of work for the Bahrain government recently, which is a, you know, a little Arab, liberal Arab state. With, with, um, they've, no, they've calculated they've got 28 years of oil left. And um, they've, got a, a pop, they've got petrol costs 17 cents a litre there at the moment, and there's no footpaths, and every, every piece of infrastructure in the country runs on oil. And they've suddenly realised, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> right? Um, and for those of you who know the Cuba story so well, through that wonderful video about um, community development, you know, to, to share that, we did a piece of work where we took, we took 15 of their um, leaders essentially through a process of understanding the solutions that are possible. And, and we ended up designing an applied university for them because they realised their population is very under, they just have a, a, a very low level of education in this, inside their own community. So that was their need. So it's a very interesting thing to start talking about. So 
we've, we've turned quali we're turning qualifications on their head. Business will turn up for four days a year, they'll get mentored support, they'll do the work in their business, about their business, and they'll get a qualification for that. Why should they come to a polytech or an institution to do that? It's absurd. They're doing the work in their workplace. Shouldn't they get credit for that? Every one of you is doing stuff somewhere. Shouldn't you get credit for it if there's evidence? Why is that any worse or better than what some lecturer prescribes? It's much better, isn't it? Because it's in situation, it's applied, it's real. So we've designed qualifications along those lines and the two th qualifications we've, we've got operating right now is a graduate diploma in sustainable practice, which is code for anything. <laughs> okay, it's a flash way of saying we don't care what floats your boat, if you can meet the requirements of, of a very, and the descriptions there of what you have to do, if you, if you can, essentially the course goes like this, learn, learn a common language, so, we, so the lawyer can talk with the vet, this is who's on a graduate program this year, lawyer, vet, um, permaculture geek, um, business owners, um, PR, public relations people, people in government, local government, you know, rah, rah, rah. We need a common language so we can all talk together. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. Okay, if we have that common language, now the lawyer can talk to the accountant who can talk to the engineer, and some magic happens. Here's the other thing. We, we want, if we're, if we're designing a curriculum based on natural principles, surely it would be self-organising. Why, why would we prescribe what time class is? It's kind of a bit weird if you think about it. I realise there's a time and a place for block courses and people getting together, but if Marg's got a great idea she wants to share with someone at four in the morning and they, she knows that the other person works at four in the morning, why aren't they having a conversation? How can you create that mechanism? So we've got, for example, a Facebook page which we work on, which is open, other people can join it, where we, if any of us, any of us see stuff we're interested in, we think other people would be interested in, we post it and we send, we send a note to people and go, look at this, I think it's great. That, that page has just absolutely gone off. I mean, it's just amazing. And the, the quality of stuff that's being put on there and commented on, and there's this running dialogue, there's this commentary. Now, is that evidence of assessment? Is that evidence? If Margaret has a conversation on there about the, the, how, how permaculture could be applied in the business world and, and I think of this language, of course it's evidence, yeah? I will sit down and look at a person from NZQA, the Qualifications Authority, who credits degrees and go, damn right, that is right there. Right? Prove to me. And we've had to go into battle over that, and it's a battle we've won. So, and we are winning. So we're in this mode that you don't need to attend lectures anymore. Lectures are just so archaic. It's just, you can get, go to the web and get anything you want. You, 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 go, you go and look at the University of Massachusetts right now, they've got, they've got about 31,000 lectures online and, and you could go in there and grab the best speakers in the world talking about any topic you're interested in for free, right? Go have a look. It's not about the content, it's not about the knowledge anymore, it's about the, the, the synergistic nature of it. How can what I'm doing in my project on my land relate to what you're doing and how can we work together? That's, that's, what, that's the new paradigm around this for me. So we, we talk about the 24-hour classroom essentially, it just doesn't stop and um, it's very, and, and more importantly, the tutor's roles are very much changing to, to one of facilitator and enabler and, and referee really, you know, it's kind of like we're holding the reins of this beast that just charges around and um, <laughs> all these hy hyperactive, high-performing nutters really, and, and they are, and it, you know, the first batch of graduates, we only started this last year and the first batch of graduates that, that have come, because we've all agreed that you never leave the course once you start it. <laughs> well, why would you? You know, why would you want to leave? It's kind of like if you're getting value and learning out of it, it's like, wouldn't you? So Flo might, some people might know Florence, who's a permi in the middle there, here, who lives in Wanaka, who couldn't come today. But, you know, the, the learning's been um, fabulous and this year we've got 20 folks around New Zealand. We deliver out of a hub in Raglan and we deliver in the out west here and we deliver out of a hub in, in Wanaka, Queenstown and um, we get together essentially every eight weeks for a couple of days um, in the south and in the north, those people. So it's a very um, interesting thing. Do you want to offer a comment, Mark, before I progress? I was just noticing one of the other um, high-performing oh, nutters walked in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you walked in at the high-performing nutter <laughs> moment. The only Paul. Yeah, right. So. What do we do with these high-performing nutters? Because I'm, what I'm interested in is doing real projects that, um, 
blow people away because you know, like the biodiesel project, let's just let's just get biofuel into Queenstown, eh? That, that's the project. Let's go. What do we got to do? Who do we have to talk to? Make a list. Let's ring up the bloody mayor and go and have a chat. And rah, 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 rah. where are we getting the money from? Rah, rah, rah. And, and it just kind of happens. So we've decided to take on a, an ambitious wee project, which is to unite councils to unite local government with their communities with commerce. So we've been working on this project now for quite a few years in Queenstown Lakes. We've got a very enlightened mayor who's all over it and is writing the cheque at the moment for, for a lot of stuff to happen in terms of providing expert facilitation. And what we've called that process shaping our future because if, if you can get commerce and council and community heading in the same direction with the same vision for our place, then you get amazing things happening. Yeah? And, and already we've, you know, because at the moment Queenstown Lakes District spends a lot of time in court arguing with developers frankly. So they're motivated to not spend time in court arguing with developers, but to rather to have productive conversations. So, the, the, and when you ask people to start looking, because the first thing we did we, through last year with the graduate students was we had these community meetings and we, ha we had um, community meetings across, Queen, across our um, communities of Queenstown, Wanaka and the, and the smaller places where we asked, where we mapped the drivers of change. What are the drivers of change? What's coming? And of course everyone's going peak oil, increasing population, increasing expenses, blah blah blah, and you get this obvious thing like this tracking, yeah? People are familiar with that idea? You know, all, lots of things are rising, quite a few things are falling. It's like, okay, if all that stuff's happening, it's compliance is tougher and blimmin government interference is a pain in the butt, you know, all those things are happening, how do we, you know, we're stuffed unless we change what we're doing, agreed? Yeah, right, good, okay, well... From that first, and we've engaged over a thousand people in this conversation now in the Queenstown Lakes, right? Which is, which is in a year is a pretty good achievement in a district that's got 30,000 people. We're now going, okay, if that's like that, what does it look like when it's like that? Yeah? In other words, when you adhere to the permaculture design principles <coughs> or the principles of, what do you look like when you can genuinely demonstrate that you're in that space. Well, okay, well, it's a very different scenario to now, isn't it? And, of course, that's the first step in this idea of awareness and in this idea of... How do you go back on Prezi, do you know? I think that's the way. What, to go back? It's not going forward. Oh. Somehow I can't tell by looking at the face. I'm going to escape. It's easier. But anyway, I might shut up now, because I've said enough. I mean, we, we look at best practice internationally. If you take a, a community like Whistler, if people don't know, it's another rich ski resort like Queenstown and, um, in the US. Or, um, it's a rich person's playground, which is suffering enormously at the moment, right? It's not in the US. Sorry, in Canada. It's in Canada. North, North America. Sorry. Yeah, get it right. Well, not the West Incident or anything. Um, but the whole model is, instead of local government making all these decisions, let's have community make these decisions. What a smart idea. Okay? So what they did at Whistler was they had task force groups in their communities around each of those things you can see on the board. So the people who really care about learning get, in, get together. People who really care about um, affordability get together. And amazing things begin to happen if they can speak a common language and they wish to, to end up in the same place. Now what we've done in Queenstown Lake so far is we've run events. Because we've, we've, we've so, we have so many people wanting to run events in our community that it impacts majorly ro closed roads booze, all the bad stuff that comes with events, as well as the great economic injections. But So we sat down and we've worked that through and it ended up being a, a process that we worked out cost $15,000 essentially to run as a process. Um, the consultant who wrote the initial report around events charged forty five, and we ran a process for 15000 which engaged over 400 people in the district to come up with the solutions. So it's kind of like local governments and they're going... That's good, we want more of that, thanks very much. So it's about applying the principles with the right language. So that's essentially, um, I might stop, um, I think. And that's essentially our work. And, I, and I'm, yeah, one minute to ask some questions. I'm sorry about that, yeah. Super quickly, speaking, yeah. The, speaking of your back planning approach to just strategic, yep. um, Whistler approach is the same thing. They said yes. the Olympics, yep. and they that's back correct. Plan. 